Assalamu alaikum again. Hello, everybody. So, our next uh, point or topic in the pathophysiology of the left to right shunt is actually the patent ductus arteriosus. What is uh, the patent ductus arteriosus? It's the normal arterial uh, uh, connection between the descending aorta. This is it here, the PDA. The normal arterial connection between the descending aorta to the pulmonary artery. This is normal in our mother's womb because blood going to, from the right ventricle to the uh, pulmonary artery is not needed in the womb to go to the lungs. Maybe just 10% goes there. The rest of because of non-inflated lungs with extremely high resistance the blood will go in utero, right to left, from the PDA to the descending aorta. And we know that the right blood in utero is actually, represents actually the blood coming back from the placenta, which is the oxygenated blood, and goes to the body to oxygenate and uh, deliver uh, the needed uh, metabolic uh, need. So, after birth, Normally, a PDA, which has uh, smooth muscles that are sensitive to oxygen, once the baby starts breathing and the oxygen saturation reaches uh, 95, this ductus will actually constrict and close. This is what happens in most of patients, and that's the normal physiology of a PDA. Here we're talking about the PDA as a disease, which means the PDA that remains open after birth by at least uh, one week to three months, that is a pathological PDA. And as we said in the VSD, because it is a communication between the left side represented here by the aorta, to the right side, represented here by the pulmonary artery. Again, the left side, aorta, left atrium, left ventricle. The right side, pulmonary arteries. Anything goes to the veins, SVC, IVC, right atrium, right ventricle, right side of our heart or of, of, or of our circulation. So the PDA in when it's left as a pathological lesion, will almost always shunt left to right, systemic to pulmonary artery. What applies in the VSD talk that we just gave actually applies mostly to the PDA also with some exceptions. It is a left to right shunt, so a small PDA, usually when we say small, less than two millimeter, will actually be extremely restrictive to pressure. So it will not transmit aortic pressure to pulmonary pressure and will not cause any effect on elevating the PA pressure nor on causing any Eisenmenger or pulmonary hypertension, reversible or irreversible. That doesn't happen because it's going to be extremely restrictive to flow and pressure. And in, in such small PDAs, less than two millimeter, the pulmonary artery pressure will not be elevated. The pulmonary artery tree or arteries will not dilate because they don't see large volume. But again, let me see if you have captured the point I said. The chamber that receives the extra blood in diastole it is the chamber that will dilate. Let's apply that to the PDA. If blood goes from the descending aorta to the pulmonary artery, now the blood is here. It's going in systole, but is that true? Is it only in systole? No, actually it is in systole and diastole. So because the diastolic pressure and resistance is also higher in the aorta compared to the pulmonary artery. We know the systolic pressure and resistance is higher. Sorry, systolic pressure is higher. Resistance is almost the same. 
in the uh, aorta, the systolic pressure is higher and it can push the blood to the pulmonary arteries in diastole, the diastolic pressure also is higher than the PA and it will cause shunt in diastole. So one feature of the PDA that it shunts continuously. That's why we hear a continuous murmur on, the, on these patients. There is a, 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 a big difference between pressures in systole and diastole on both sides. The aorta is always higher in systole and diastole, so the shunt happens in both. So let's go back and say now, this pulmonary artery is receiving the blood in systole and diastole. Would it dilate if that blood was significant enough? Yes, it would. Obviously because of volume and pressure. What will happen? That extra blood will go to the pulmonary arteries and will come to the pulmonary vein as extra blood plus the normal cardiac output that's already coming. Which chamber is going to receive that extra blood, blood from this PDA? The chamber that will receive it in diastole, we said the first was the MPA and the branch pulmonary arteries. The second is again the left atrium and again the left ventricle. So obviously in PDAs, which are not small, moderate or large, moderate will mean two, maybe up to 3.5 millimeter, and large meaning four millimeter and above. In these PDAs, which are significant, not the small restrictive ones, not the ones with less than two millimeter diameter, the main pulmonary artery can dilate, the left pulmonary artery can dilate, and the left ventricle can dilate. And I have forgotten to mention in the VSD, when we have left ventricular dilatation, the mitral ring may actually uh, dilate. The aortic annulus may dilate, and we may have, uh, 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 because of that, uh, mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation, just to complete the picture. Same could happen with the PDA if the shunt was large and significant LV and LA dilatation. So again, it is a left to right shunt and the left side gets dilated, but could the right side also hypertrophy and dilate? Yes, it can. In PDAs, it's actually more common than in the, uh, in the VSD. Not talking again about small PDAs. We're talking about moderate, or moderate to large or large PDAs. It is more common than the VSD to have main pulmonary artery dilatation, main pulmonary artery and branch pulmonary artery elevated pressure and right ventricular dilatation and hypertrophy because the right ventricle will see the elevated pressure and uh, pressure because of the uh, PDA. This is one feature that's touch, difference than, uh, touch different than the VSD, it is more likely with a moderate to large PDA to see right ventricular hypertrophy dilatation and uh, MPA dilatation and elevated pressure with always the main chamber being dilated, the left ventricle and the left atrium. And do you know why is that so? Why is the PDA different? I said that in the start, that because the PDA shunts both in systole and diastole. That's why a four millimeter PDA might equal, which we call large, might equal a large VSD, which is an eight millimeter VSD, double the size, because in the VSD, the shunt is mainly systolic, and in the PDA, the shunt is systolic and diastolic, giving more volume, more cardiac output to where it shouldn't go, which is the main pulmonary artery, and stealing the blood away from the aorta. So we will see more LA dilatation, more LV dilatation, more susceptibility to have higher PA pressure and pulmonary artery dilatation, more increased pulmonary blood flow and the effect on the pulmonary vascular bed, be it being more full of blood and on the x-ray it looks more obvious, apparent 
uh, increased, reversed vascular appearance of, of the lungs on, uh, a chest, uh, on the chest X-ray. Not only that, the effect of a PDA, moderate to large, on the PA pressure uh, on the long run is far much more uh, deleterious compared to the VSD. A large PDA, four millimeter or above, actually exposes the pulmonary artery to high pressure during systole and diastole. Exposes the pulmonary pressure to extra flow during systole and diastole, and the pulmonary vascular injury is expedited. So in a very large PDA, we don't wait too long. In a very large PDA, from the start, within the first few weeks of life, if we recognize this is a large PDA that's not going to close, it will need to be closed, whether interventionally or uh, surgically, to prevent its complications. The pulmonary arteriolar edema that we spoke about in the VSD will be even more obvious here. The symptomatology will be more obvious. Uh, a, a moderate size PDA will almost be equal to a large size uh, P, uh, VSD, causing significant dyspnea whether at rest or with exercise, and significant also failure to thrive, like a large VSD uh, for the patient because of consumption of the cardiac output to the pulmonary area and the work a breathe that is increased, consuming all these calories, taking it away from the baby and not letting the baby uh, grow. So, similar to the VSD, but worse, is the PDA in causing more left right chant, more increased pulmonary blood flow, more pulmonary arteriolar edema, more pulmonary hypertension, more LA and LV dilatation because it is shunting systole and diastole. And also Eisenmenger syndrome can complicate PDAs much earlier compared to uh, a VSD. And it is known that if we come late and cause large PDAs, the pulmonary, even at, at the time when they show some reversibility, a lot of these patients later on will become pulmonary hypertensive patients because of the continued, previously continued transmission of pressure from the aorta to the PAs has already established some changes and injury in the pulmonary vascular resistance that will continue to develop later on even after closing the PDA and develop the pulmonary hypertension. One unique uh, aspect of uh, the PDA pathophysiology if you have a PDA, there is a, a good uh, or a different point that we call blood flow steel. What do we, we, we mean by steel? You see, in systole, everybody is going to get the ejected blood. That's fine. But it is diastolic blood or diastolic pressure that you depend on to perfuse your body. And that diastolic blood will be stolen in diastole, taken back into the uh, pulmonary arteries, depriving all the organs where this blood is being stolen from, from the cardiac output needed. So ischemia, especially in neonates and in prematures, can be a pathophysiological feature. And the most common site that we see this ischemia to is to this planknic area, the gut, and necrotizing enterocolitis can be an effect of the presence of a very large uh, 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 PDA in a premature or a neonate. Not only that, the, such um, uh, steel in diastole may cause the diastolic pressure or the mean diastolic pressure or the mean blood pressure to be much lower than accepted normally to the extent that it can cause even coronary uh, ischemia because really the blood in systole is being stolen from every part of the aorta back into uh, the pulmonary artery. And clinically, we can figure out how much uh, be, is being lost in, uh, in diastole from that steel by a very wide pulse pressure on the 
uh, on the blood pressure, a difference of over 40 to 60 millimeter mercury between systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. I'll give you an example. You might find a baby with a blood pressure of 80 over 30. So 80 is probably acceptable in that uh, neonate, but 30 is quite low. Why is it 30? Because of the significant stolen blood into the pulmonary artery through the PDA uh, uh, during uh, diastole. And, and these cases really require more attention because ischemia or lack of cardiac output is, a, uh, a, a, is of a deleterious uh, effect uh, on the patient. So um, a PDA is a good example or follows most of what we have talked about in the VSD, except that it shunts additionally in VSD, it tends to cause more pulmonary hypertension, more left side dilatation, can cause right ventricular hypertrophy even from early on because of transmission of pressure to the pulmonary artery both in systole and diastole. It is or it has a unique uh, part to it which is a, uh, diastolic steel and the last thing sometimes the pathophysiology of a PDA is uh, associated with a coarctation of the uh, aorta and that adds to the LV uh, difficulty because now the LV will be loaded with blood, the left ventricle, and actually when it tries to eject here, it will be obstructed. So loaded and obstructed, receiving cannot push the blood outside, that can give significant heart failure and LV uh, dysfunction. By this, I'm finished with the PDA. I'm sure, again, there are points that I may have not covered. I wish I have covered uh, most that concerns you. And our, in our third session, we'll be talking about the ASD. Thank you.